Hey folks, it's Jeremy, the host of Blamo. Thanks so much for listening. This is a preview of one of our exclusive shows on Patreon. These are member-supported shows, meaning they only happen because of our incredible members and community. So check out a preview of the episode, and if you like it, consider joining us on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Blamo, where we have tons of exclusive Blamo episodes, shows, our amazing Slack group, and we're adding new things for members all the time. If not, no worries, we still love you, and we literally have hundreds of episodes of Blamo all free for you to dive into. Thanks so much. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Die Work Right podcast. My name is Derek Guy, and my co-host is Peter Zotello. So this is a bit of a weird episode. As some listeners may remember, last year, Peter and I interviewed Seji McCarthy, who is a bespoke shoemaker based in Japan. One of the questions I asked him was, why are there so many craftspeople in Japan? I mean, in Tokyo alone, you have maybe over a dozen bespoke tailors and shoemakers, whereas you don't even have that number in all of the United States. According to Seji, one of the reasons is the availability of affordable real estate. Rent there is maybe a third of what you might pay in San Francisco or New York City, which makes it much easier to get by as a craftsperson. This way, you can make a living even if you only sell maybe two or three pairs of bespoke shoes per month, whereas in the U.S., you have to have a much larger scale business. So when Joe McReynolds, co-author of the new book Emergent Tokyo, reached out to me to see if I want to talk about urban planning in Tokyo, I was like, yeah, actually, I would love to talk about that. It's a bit of a weird conversation for a menswear podcast because we talked to him about dense, low-rise neighborhoods, mixed-use buildings, human-scale urbanism, not things that are directly about clothes, but hopefully it sheds some light on something that we all care about, the ability for artisans to make a living in any given city. Let's dive in. Hey, Peter. Good to see you again. Good to see you too, Derek. We have an exciting guest today. We do have an exciting guest today. Um, His name is Joe McReynolds. And he's a professor of urban studies and subcultures. Um, and it, I know it seems odd to talk to an urban studies professor on a menswear podcast, but in the past year or so, um, we've talked about how the economics of certain cities affects the growth of small businesses and also the ability to have artisans such as tailors and shoemakers. And last time, you know, a couple months ago, we spoke to Seji McCarthy, who's a bespoke shoemaker, uh, an American bespoke shoemaker, but based in Tokyo. And during our conversation, we were talking about why are there so many tailors and shoemakers in Tokyo versus New York City or San Francisco? And he talked about how the rent there is much cheaper and it's much easier to make a living uh, making clothes and shoes than it is in New York City where rents are very high. So when this book came out, Joe McReynolds is um, a co-author of this book called um, Emergent Tokyo, Designing the Spontaneous City. Even though it's not a book about menswear, Um, it's about kind of urban planning and policy in Tokyo. I thought it would be really good to get his perspective on how urban planning in Tokyo may allow for the growth of kind of artisan businesses. And how other cities can learn from that and allow cities to experience emergent growth with a little bit of direction. Yeah. Um, So, Joe, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background? Hey, everyone. Uh, So... I came to studying cities through a very strange path. Um, By training, I'm a national security analyst and intelligence analyst. And uh, I spent my 20s traveling the world uh, and just seeing different cities as much as I could, falling in love with cities. And I always found Tokyo the most fascinating city in the world, uh, especially in terms of just people exploring their personal passions and different kinds of possibilities for how you can have a community or a subculture or a a micro business, you name it, just people doing the things that really made them feel alive. And I wondered why it was that Tokyo worked so differently than American cities or Western cities. And uh, it, it there wasn't a lot of great information in English about just from a really comprehensive point of view of, of why it was that Tokyo works so differently than New York, L.A., San Francisco. And I moved over to Tokyo for a year as a, a fellow at the Japanese Ministry of Defense originally, actually, to to as an excuse to to research 
Tokyo's urbanism, how Tokyo functions as a city. And I had been an obsessive on this for years. I'd been collecting primary source materials. I, I speak Japanese separately, just from high school onward, public school, California, studied Japanese. And I've been collecting primary source materials, getting into this research, and that ended up being this giant rabbit hole, a project of years and years, linked up with an urban studies laboratory in Tokyo and, and became a visiting professor at this university, Keio University. And we, we wrote this book together, Emergent Tokyo, uh, that is really just explaining not just for specialists, but for really anyone who's curious about Tokyo, why it works so differently than other cities in the world. And, and what are the lessons that San Francisco, my hometown in Los Angeles, Southern California, New York, and DC, where I'm partly based now, what any of these cities could learn from Tokyo-style urbanism. So one thing that I liked about your book is that it touches on actual policies. And one thing that comes up often in, in menswear discussions on the topic of why there are so many tailors and shoemakers in Tokyo is that people usually just kind of explain everything with culture. Yes. And my feeling is that culture matters. I do think that culture certainly matters, especially, um, you know, with the COVID pandemic, for example, you could see how, you know, uh, culture may affect people's willingness to put on a mask or or, or not. Um, but but one of the things that I find is that when you try to explain some type of social phenomenon, let's say you're trying to explain why a certain city is rich, for example, mm -hmm. you might map out some kind of some model for it. So you may have like variables A, B, C, and D, and those variables may be you know some important law, the shape of political institutions, um, you know path dependency, um, colonization, and, you know, all, all of these variables. And then at the end, we have E, which is stuff that we can't explain, like just the difference between these two different cities and why some city is richer than the other. And that variable is usually just what we use to, we explain all of that kind of variance with culture. Mm -hmm. And the more we add to this model, the more variables we put in, the more explanatory kind of grit we can we can use to say oh actually it's because of this law and this policy and these things the explanatory variable of e of culture ends up shrinking absolutely and one thing that i liked about your book is that um it gets into actual policies and i i bring up culture because on the issue of menswear when people discuss why are there so many tailors and shoemakers in japan the go-to answer is oh well the japanese are very reverent of tradition <laughs> uh you know, whatever it's like yeah. Confucian teaching and, you know, all of, which is, I, I think it is true. Again, I, I think culture matters, but often people use culture to explain things that they don't know well enough in terms of policy and history and, you know, all of the, all of the stuff that actually gets us a lot of explanatory power. Absolutely. So the very beginning of your book talks about um, the kind of the different approaches towards urbanism and how things went from a top-down approach to market approach to this kind of emergent approach. Can you talk a little bit about that history? Yeah. And first, I just want to say absolutely on the, on the cultural point, and that's a huge issue in studying Tokyo, especially because you read Western media writing about Tokyo and it's all you know, well, the Japanese are mysterious and exotic people. Therefore, like it's <laughs> yeah. it's Orientalist horseshit and it's unfalsifiable for the most part. So you can't, uh, unless you really have a lot of data in front of you, you, you can't say, well, I don't think that's right uh, unless you, you've really spent your time on it. But it doesn't actually tell you anything. And also, if you go back a century and look at Japan, the stereotypes about Tokyo and Japan were completely opposite stereotypes. It was, it was, oh, nothing's ever on time. It's noisy. It's dirty. Uh, can't trust anyone. Like the complete opposite stereotypes. So it's like, did Japanese culture do a complete 180 in a span of years or? Were there actual concrete factors here that usually, especially old white guys writing about Tokyo, were too lazy uh, to really do the work to research and, and put in print? And so, yeah, especially something like menswear that can be very local and yet also very global. You have these these particular traditions and craftsmanship and heritage, uh, but also you have a global economy and 
and now a, a global subculture around uh, around this this fashion uh, subset. I, I think it's it's really important to kind of peel back the layers and say we're not just gonna we're not just going to assume that everything is down to culture. Yeah, I really like how in your introduction you totally swept that under the rug and said we're not going to discuss stories either from the Japanese themselves saying, well, yes, this is just the yeah, Japanese yeah. way or from people from yeah, the, the out- Japanese right wing is also invested in making the same Orientalist argument aimed at Japan from themselves, because then it, you can say, uh, oh, well, immigrants and feminism and liberals are threatening uh, our pu- pristine and pure Japanese culture. <laughs> right. yeah, so it's there. there's Orientalism and from the Japanese political right, this kind of self-Orientalism, uh, both of which are, are just not actually true in terms of understanding why Tokyo works the way it works, why you have these huge artisan communities in Tokyo. Yeah. So you said you were going to look through the lens of data science. Yeah. And and we doing that, we actually found uh, this fascinating history in part dating back to the black market period, they call it, to the immediate post-World War II period in Japan, where Tokyo is nearly totally destroyed through firebombing. And they have a grand plan to rebuild the city, but they don't have the money to carry it out. And so they end up telling ordinary people, for the most part, you're kind of on your own. Uh, Just rebuild as best you can, and we'll figure it out down the road. And so you have all these kind of tiny ramshackle plots in old school neighborhoods of Tokyo where you trace it back and it's, oh, this this neighborhood, the, it looks the way it looks because that's how it was rebuilt after the World War II uh, firebombing. But then you can also see a real pattern language going back to the 1800s to to when Tokyo was, was Edo, the old capital. Um, and you look at old maps compared to new ones, and you you see that even after the Great Kanto Earthquake of 23, where most of Tokyo burned to the ground, uh, or the firebombing of World War II, that the city kind of regrew itself organically like a phantom limb uh, or a lost limb of a, an amphibian or something, where... Uh, Ordinary people are given incredible freedom to rebuild their local environment, and they do it at a, at a small human scale that makes for this this very livable city where people are able to pursue kind of human scale passions and and the economics work out. Can we can we cover a little bit just as a history of urbanism? You had written a little bit about this kind of top down urbanism this kind of market-based urbanism, this emergent urbanism. And what you're describing is this kind of new emergent system. But what is what is top-down urbanism and the kind of market-based urbanism? What does is, what is that history and yeah, sure. what do those systems mean? So uh, the modernists in, in urbanism, in, in planning of cities, you had the, the modernists were people who thought with modern data and science and technology, this is in you know 1960s, 1970s, uh, we can plan cities from the top down with with science and it's this kind of uh master planner will figure out everything from the top central planning energy um at the same at the same time as you had in in global geopolitics kind of like a rise of central planning ideologies you know communism uh democratic socialism and so th- this idea that we can plan the cities of the future down to the minutia and then that didn't work out so well best laid plans uh, a lot of unintended consequences and so then you have a generation of planners from there that kind of threw up their hands and said, we don't actually know what makes a city great or how to plan it. So let's let's let the market decide. And and there's kind of this swing, not just among planners, but in in urban politics uh towards corporate redevelopment and uh just general total freedom for megacorps to build as they like in cities and um though in American cities oftentimes still kind of restrictive zoning and things like that to deal with but there there's a overall a massive relaxation as you're going into the the Reaganite 1980s and nine in deregulatory 1990s and 
So that swings the pendulum far in the other direction. And people start to say, oh, there are major problems that this either doesn't handle or exacerbates. Massive disparities in wealth and accessibility, and and you end up with just a sterile city for the rich, where ordinary people aren't well taken care of necessarily. So between these two extremes, I think a lot of urbanists are now starting to home in on a, a kind of blended or hybrid approach where from the top down, you try and set broad conditions of, of kind of rules of the road for a city that... Want to hear the rest? Listen to the full episode and many more other exclusive episodes over on our Patreon. Visit patreon.com forward slash Blamo to sign up and join the Blam fam. You also get access to our exclusive members only Slack group where we chat about this and a ton of other things. So head over to patreon.com forward slash Blamo and we'll see you there.